you all for being here today. I'm glad we got better weather than we had yesterday. And thank you, gentlemen, for, for joining us. Well, the first question is probably the obvious question. In this day and age when, um, you know, opera and classical music in general is supposed to be marginalized and, and not uh, a, you know, uh, part of the popular culture and so on and not the most lucrative thing to do in the world and perhaps doesn't reach the widest audiences um, compared to popular music and culture. Why opera? What, uh, both, both from a personal standpoint, each of you as artists, and from the, uh, you know, a larger artistic you know, standpoint, or, or cultural staff, but what has attracted each of you to write opera? So whoever wants to start, we can go and do this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, music. I, I mean, I love music. It's a pretty simplistic answer, but I just think there's something um, why opera, music can sort of fill you up and excite you in a way and, and tell a story in a way that that's just very singular and exciting and uh, visceral. And yeah, so for me, that's why you know, music can just do something. You have to look right at music. Um, so, yeah, and like in our story, I mean, it was just, it's, I, I don't even know if I would have any interest in a version of the story without music, just because it, it's just, it's, it just makes so much sense. Um, as a story that that's that's being told. Yeah, I guess I would agree. I mean, I, I like but I, 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 I would sort of very simple. Answer. I I would sort of back up sort of into your question a little more because I I, I, I grew up at a time when I well, I, I just I've never thought that classical music has been sort of marginal just because I'm I'm like wickedly spoiled <laughs> in, in that sense. That, but I was born in 1981, so it's like I I didn't live through any of the kind of culture wars and blah 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 blah, blah and. And so instead, I, I sort of grew up in this in this highly charged atmosphere of of music and classical music and opera specifically being a very important part of you know even though I wasn't involved in it as a kid, you just sort of kind of aware of it. Mm -hmm. So it it doesn't feel like making a, making a sort of crazy decision to mm -hmm. you know relearn you know, typesetting the 17th century set. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, a, yeah, definitely. Seems mm -hmm. like what we need to do is create an environment in this country where all the kids grow up the way you did. Honestly. <laughs> well, where, right. where, no, seriously. I mean, that's the, that, of course, that's a whole other a topic for a whole other panel discussion, perhaps a week, weekend seminar. <laughs> but uh, the idea of, of, you know, the way to uh, uh, plant classical music into the, the real, the fabric, if you will, to make metaphors of, of this country, this country's culture. Ricky? Um, I, um, I was going to say why I live. <laughs> um, as far as, I, I grew up obsessed with opera, and that has not waned. I've just always been, and, and what I think about opera, especially having worked a lot in the musical theater, is opera is still, it feels like the largest, most exciting form. And if you've done a lot of work in musical theater when you're constantly being told what the limitations are, and then you're given the resources, hopefully, if the opera company you are writing for has them, but even any resources are more than you get in musical theater. I mean, eight pieces is like, you know, a miracle in the orchestra. So I feel like opera is still the largest, most exciting form to me, where every art form comes together, dance, visual, music, theater, and you can say a lot in that form. And I still feel like if a theater is filled with 1,500 people, a lot can be said that's still meaningful. And, you know, I, I feel like we're in a, you know, it's a, it's a dark time, and I still feel like anyone that who has, you know, who wants to contribute something beautiful or meaningful to the world is doing a great service at this point. Well, I, I want to second what Ricky said because when you when you make opera, first of all, it's a composer's medium. Sorry to the librettist here, but it actually is, and that's unusual in the theater. And I think that echoes what you're talking about. And and the second thing is that you do get all the big toys, which is fun. 
and you get to play on a canvas that is very large, that has a kind of scope and ambition that is not typical for any other kind of, certainly classical music, but almost anything else, um, except maybe film, but that's a different kind of medium. And, but I would say that I actually backed into making opera. I, I was not interested in opera. I didn't grow up interested in opera. Mm -hmm. I played the rock and roll band. I sang as a cantor in the synagogue. I had no, I mean, what my knowledge of opera was, you know, the few times we went to the Houston Grand Opera when I was a child for school. And there were fat people singing up there and it wasn't that interesting. Um, but by the same token, when I started to get interested in making something dramatic and musical, um, I was in college and I was always interested in visual elements, movement, uh, sound, drama, theater. And so um, I decided for my thesis in college to write um, an opera, I didn't know what that meant really, mm. based on Joyce's portrait of the artist as a young man, oh, which was kind of nutty. And I did it, and in the process of doing it, I actually fell in love with the form. So I came, I, I've learned actually more by doing, and then by listening, rather than by listening than doing. That, that all of you have very, really varied backgrounds and ways into the art form. My That's true. I mean, I uh, never envisioned writing for live arts at all. It was, uh, I was actually a harpsichord uh, student at uh, Brandeis University. So the two recorder played uh, two of into my ear. I said, this will never do. <laughs> I came to New York to be a journalist, uh, very young. And journalist. And in the next five years, I was going to turn my own paper and so sort of thing. Uh, God knows how I ended up in opera. It was with him. Um, we wrote a crazy play called Where Is Dick? Which somebody said, Oh, that's an opera. I said, Fine. It's an opera. <laughs> <laughs> in the next few years, I was an uh, but I think So you never really made a conscious decision? No, but I think, I think you could sit around and debate why opera, um, or maybe 10 years ago, was a better time to be entering an opera mm -hmm. 10 years from now. The point is if you want to write it, if that's a color you want to, mm -hmm. want to express through your writing, this is the best time to do it, because this is the time we're here. Mm -hmm. um, and we might as well make it work. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are, the why opera question is slightly different for the composers and the artists. Uh, I think that the theater is a great place to write for too, but it's very rich. Uh, and uh, for a while, the opera world was uh, maybe a little bit more open to New Orleans. Hmm. Um, and you say for a while, and, and you well, they're getting re-regimented. Um, but you know, these things come and go. As I say, don't worry about this decade, that uh -huh. decade. Just do what you do, and it's uh, you know, and and you'll find out the rules when you get there, and they they do differ, and you have to uh, adjust what you. If you're the little for opera, because of Stuart and Ricky, and you point out it is a composer's medium. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that <coughs> the singers want to sing stupid stuff. Mm -hmm. So the playwrights have um, a, a real role there, and they have to bring what they do and their colors and their sensibilities and learn how to make it work for them. And then they can go and play, or they can write a musical, or whatever they want. The point is to try and do it all, not marginalize yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think the composers do that too, with their ballets and their symphonies, and their, they're all writing everything. Mm -hmm. Very, very many of you. Yeah, uh, some I think uh, perhaps concentrating more on opera and vocal music. But um, you know, I think all of you have had such diverse answers to this question, and some of you, perhaps from a more personal standpoint, uh, some from a more global standpoint. But let me uh, take the question a little bit further, and and just uh, ask. For you, uh, because uh, again, so many of you have written in different genres um, and different stage genres, particularly. There, you've written dance pieces, uh, with composers. You know, you've written, uh, you know, uh, musical theater in many cases. Um, uh, Nico has even written a scent. <laughs> so, what what makes something an opera? I mean, what? How does a, a stage Piece, you know, a, a music theater piece to become classified as an opera. What for you makes that difference? Out of Ricky and, and Stuart sort of, you know, dip their toe into that question. But anybody want to 
I actually, I, can, I was going to ask you a question. I, I first heard your, I, I, your op operatic work as CDs, which is really, which is interesting. I feel like that's uh, that's a lot to do with the way, and this is when I was growing up in, in high school and college, like the way that one would buy this thing was on CD. Uh -huh. I listened to it, and I, I, it never, it literally didn't occur to me until afterwards that when someone's like, oh, that opera, I'm like, that's an opera? Which is, which is, I think, a great thing. That it, it's something that can work in a, in a variety of ways. And the recording of the thing, which I think, you know, I, I'd, I'd be interested to know, like, for instance, like, with Orpheus and Lucy, like, in terms of how many people get into it through actually seeing it versus how many people get into it versus hearing it on the CD. Mm -hmm. And I, I had the same strange experience growing up where, in my head, there was this really active distinction between between oratorio and opera. And I feel like you know, in the in, in if you read the press, it, there's always this conversation about like, is it music theater or is it opera, yeah. which is a boring conversation. It is. Whereas oratorio <laughs> versus opera is like much more interesting and complicated. Mm -hmm. For for instance, like both of the two early Adams operas, mm -hmm. um, Nixon and Klinghoffer, in my head, are oratorios. Yeah. Weirdly, even though they're operas, obviously, but right. in, in in the strange kind of Taxonomy of yeah, and so I, I guess I wonder like, Ed, do, do you do you deal with that? Do you think about well, that? Well, I mean, when you were saying that, what I was thinking was that I think in some ways we grew up. It was a lucky time for the redefining of the word opera, hmm. because don't forget Robert Wilson was calling things he was doing operas. Meredith Monk was calling her pieces operas. And though I grew up on, you know, I went to the Met every Saturday, starting from about eight years old, hmm. you know, and city opera. However, um, especially something like Orpheus and Eurydice, I, I started thinking of everything as, as um, I started seeing things more three-dimensionally. So like, and like with Orpheus and Eurydice, it was my idea, like I asked Link, et cetera, if we could present it as a dance piece right. and somehow incorporate dance language into what the singers and the players are doing. But um, I, I just think, you know, the I, your question about opera versus musical theater, I just, I still say, it's just, it's such a question of scale and, and size. Now, I just want to clarify, I didn't say, not to, this is not to, you know, start a fight, but I didn't say that it was a composer's medium, only because I'm very sensitive. No, I do. You know, you <laughs> but I, because I'm sensitive to words, and I think My extraordinary librettos. Like <laughs> no, the, the no. <laughs> <laughs> like even growing up, like Mathan Wee Piper, you know, like librettists oh, yeah. who were great librettists yeah. really struck a chord with me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Well, not to mis not not to misrepresent what I said. I said it's a composer's medium because if it doesn't translate to composer's right. music, it doesn't happen. That's and the one yes. and, it's, the and the collaboration yes. is key. Yes. I, w I would say that the collaboration is a kind of chemical reaction. It's also the thing that you create together is different than you would do separately or with other people. So I, I, that is not to demean the role of the other collaborators. It's just that it has to, the, the librettist and everybody else has to communicate through the composer's music. If they don't, the piece is dead. If they do, it wins. Yes. And that's that's why I said it's composer. Yes. You know, Corey, I think that the question shouldn't be addressed in a qualitative way. That's for critics and mm -hmm. scholars to sit around and debate, and we're still doing it about yeah. court and this and that. Who cares? Uh -huh. <laughs> the point is that these, these fields, opera, music, theater, are set up in very different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're writing an opera, you have to write it for opera singers. Right. Well, or I was they just they can't gonna, cope. Exactly. Yeah. And I was they just can't bring cope up. if you, if, you know, Meredith yeah. Monk can get away with it, but basically they want an acoustic orchestra. Right. And they don't want a lot of amplification. Mm -hmm. And they can't do it seven nights a week. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to take days off in mm -hmm. between. And that's the basic difference. Yeah. And the colors of, the, of your work is less important than that structural difference. It's true. It's interesting. And, and it's interesting to me, actually, Michael, that uh, it, it, se it seems to me that you've expressed that in sort of a negative way, what opera singers can't do. I know, but, but But I mean, um, I think that, it, is it true? Because it would seem, from my perspective, that uh, part of what uh, makes opera opera and what makes opera attractive to musical dramatists is what the operatic voice can do. Um, that mm -hmm. you know, that's yeah. different. You know, it's, but it, I mean, it's what it can do. But I think I, I also think about it in terms of what it. I mean, it's 
it's a it's it's sort of a dressage, <laughs> where it's this highly stylized series of, of like ritualized gestures mm -hmm. that can be extended in one way or another. But it really is a kind of a limited and beautiful set of tricks. But the minute you ask them to to do, I mean, it's it's very the, the, the path is pretty clear, and the minute you 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 get off that. Uh -huh. there's, a, there's a lot of anxiety. So for instance, that's really interesting. For instance, what things um, have you run up against, Nico, um, that, that you felt were limitations of all the things? Uh, I, would say, I mean, I would say any of, any of the, any of the vocal styles that's associated with like the American minimalism, like from the 60s and 70s, right. like you're not, it's, it takes a long time for opera singers to relax and repeat. Mm -hmm. A simple phrase mm -hmm. with no time, right. even though that's something that you know. This is something that Meredith Monk has been doing since, right. you know, since she's in the womb, probably. Right. And and you know, when you say, "Oh no, it's like that Meredith Monk thing last song," and they say, "Who?" Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, they come from a really right. different. It's like somebody from a different planet. For know? instance, you know, the right. little repeated phrases. That's hard. Um, ugly, ugly sounds. Ugly sounds that they're not choosing to make because it's Strauss. Do you know what I mean? If you, right. if you, I mean, this is the interesting thing, and a lot of that has to do with how you're asking. Because, for instance, if you see, if you see, Zalame, Carita Car Car makes insanely ugly noises yeah. in that, right? Right. She jumps down three octaves and yeah. grunts, and it's like it's right. very kind of barnyard. Yes. But if you if you wrote it out, yeah. they'd be like, "Are you crazy? I'm right. not singing this." You know. So yeah. it's an interesting. You have to. No, it is. It's true. Mm -hmm. Yet, um, I would point out though that that Zalame is not Mozart. It's not Handel. You know, they're in different styles. Just as the style that that you write in has different mm -hmm. vocal requirements. But I think it's 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 interesting because that, again, if you think about it as a, as sort of like a balletic body or something, mm -hmm. or something that has this kind of extreme things. But <coughs> if you're if you're going to ask for something exceptional. Mm -hmm. You know they physically can do it because anyone physically can. You know, mm -hmm. you can but it, it's about it's about knowing the, the, the way to ask for. Again, I, again, I really do mm -hmm. think about it as, as sort of like a horse thing, where if you want them to change which lead they're cantering on, <laughs> it's, you have to perform this very sort of buto series of small gestures uh -huh. with the thighs, yes. and then all of a sudden it does what you want. <laughs> no, that, that's, that's really that's really really interesting, and I think probably that was true all throughout operatic history. I mean, you constantly. You know, uh, if you read the, the musicology literature, as I have, you know, you're always reading about, you know, the, these singers were complaining, and you know, the singers who were singing the premiere of Carmen, they all were going to quit because it was unsingable, and you know, the Don Ottavio uh, complained that he couldn't sing Ilio Pizarro, so Mozart uh, had to write Dallas. So yeah, I mean, the, the the form and time dictate what singers are capable of, so. If, if Nico's work takes it somewhere else, mm -hmm. then that's what singers will be capable of. And I do think mm -hmm. in this time we're living in, singers are suddenly required to act in a new way simply because we're in the age of everything is filmed and shown on gigantic screens. Right. And suddenly you see singers much more conscious of their looks and their, and sometimes to a disadvantage because a lot of singers are sort of disqualified because they're not necessarily ready for cinematic history, <laughs> and yet they're some of the greatest singers in the world. It's, sure. a, it's a weird time for it singers. Is a weird time. Except that singers are capable of doing more than they, than they, they think. ever have. Yeah, well, and also oh. they're more capable of doing anything that they've ever done. And I think that the problem with opera in <coughs> America, or particularly with American composers or English, in, in the English language, but I think about American English particularly, is that our vocal tradition is not operatic. It's more jazz, blues, pop, mm -hmm. um, and also experimental techniques and extended techniques. And so that you have, I mean, really for me, mm -hmm. the great icon is Billie Holiday. Right. And so the idea of melismatic singing, about the way that you communicate the language, about the fact that consonants are actually percussive, mm -hmm. all those things have to be taught mm -hmm. to the singers, or at least coached yes. so that you get the kind of result mm -hmm that you want. So when, when I'm in a rehearsal, one of the things that's most important to me is actually to communicate those desires and to actively coach the mm -hmm. singers to get that result. And once it's once it's ingrained, it comes out naturally because mm -hmm. it's the tradition that we come from here. Yeah. But it's not the tradition in which they're taught. Right. And that, so that where they come from and where they're taught mm -hmm. are at odds with each other. It's ways. true. And I do think there are some very forward-looking teachers in certain of the conservatories now 
um, I'm thinking particularly like with the Catherine Chesinski up at Eastman, you know, yeah, well, Kathy's who are a great example of really, a performer who did oh, that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, she was a pioneer in, in things like extended vocal techniques, and now she's a professor at a major conservatory, and she and, and uh, a number of her colleagues throughout the country are very mindful of, of just what you're talking about, and are really have begun to teach young singers. It's, it's a funny, I mean, the funny thing also, that whenever, if you're auditioning singers, I, it's the weirdest thing, like, where I, I, I was auditioning a young English singers, and they must have, they just, they must have Googled me or something, they were like, all right, he's a gay American, so we're going to sing Ain't it, Ain't it a Pretty Night. <laughs> One, that's hilarious. There was like 15 of yes. these, like, adorable little sopranos from Ireland would come in and play, and they were saying Ain't it a Pretty Night. Yeah. And I was thinking about Ain't it a Pretty Night, and it's like, that, uh, no, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's it's exactly right. that, that aria opened up a lot of people, especially American singers, oh, yeah. willing, willingness to, to play with accent while singing. Sometimes to embarrassing effect. Yeah. But, yes. I, but I think, you know, cause sometimes it gets real corn pone. Uh -huh. like, but, but it's really like, yeah, I, th I think that's a really interesting aria where I think it, it I think things start that it, it, catalogs. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> But I think it opened things up in a really good way. You know, and one one wishes maybe that then the last eight minutes of Sancho Graha would become a similarly taught thing, where it's like everyone calm down and do the scale in Sanskrit, and make it beautiful, and and navigate the idea of straight tone vibrato in a sensible and thoughtful way. Well, I mean, in terms of straight tone and vibrato, what, I mean, the other thing that's interesting is a lot of composers. I mean, I think about Sancho Graha in particular, and also a lot of Steve Bright's pieces. They really the composers interested in early music, singers, right? Right. Not in opera yeah. singers, well, and you can get away been. with that in an opera house, mm -hmm. I think, and and with others. There has yeah. been, you know, it, this interesting ghettoization in, in American musical uh, training for a number of years. I remember it from my own conservatory experience. They were like the opera singers; they all sat together in the cafeteria, <laughs> and then there were the early music slash contemporary music singers, and they all sat together. Um, so I think uh, we, we are again beginning to mix it up more, um, and, and I know. You know, when I when I hear auditions nowadays, I hear much more American music, much more contemporary music. And, and not and just Green Finch and Leonard Bird. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah I mean, much like more, for singing. instance, like, than, than when I was a voice student conservatory, there's way, way much more of a cognizance of, of American vocal rap and, and even some more progressive American vocal rap. So that's important. You know, I think that it's our job to um, write to the maximum ability. Of these good. singers, and that um, helps decide what's opera, what's musical. I mean, Ivan and I were driving in the car listening to Lenny Bernstein's recording of Candy, mm. and June Anderson was singing Queen okay. And I was just thinking, Bernstein, it's very interesting. He wrote all of these things for Broadway as musicals mm. West Side Story, Candy, Trouble in Tahiti. And then later on in his career, decided to reposition all of them as operas. Yeah. And recording the role of them with his own companion with opera singers. And June Anderson can hit these notes like nobody's business, no problem at all. Barbara's cook is strained to the max to do it, and it's thrilling. Yes. And when you make a singer really work, mm -hmm. maybe that helps decide if it's an opera mm. musical. If they're working, that nobody else can do what they're doing. Mm. And that's what an opera singer can do without amplification. An opera singer, he or she can make an experience between themselves and 3,000 people mm -hmm. in the house who, and that orchestra and that conductor and get to the, get to your soul. Mm -hmm. uh, a musical theater performer probably can't do that. Mm -hmm. So you write to their strengths. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And again, if, it's, if it's like an Andre McDonald, we'll just go back and forth. Yes. Yeah. There, there are these. There are. Right. You love them. It's so right. and yeah. But I feel like we shouldn't even men mention the names because they're so precious. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a go away if we say it too many times. Speaking clearly, it's not impossible. There are these people who are, who are actually capable yeah. of delivering, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Right. It's just yeah. when it's hard, it's more exciting. Yeah. Huh, that's interesting. Well, um, I, you know, that's a whole, that opens up a whole can of worms in terms of like, you know, vocal technique and stuff like that because, you know, uh, singers and voice teachers will say, well, it, it shouldn't ever be, you know, at least singers should be able to master it enough so that it's not it's not placing a strain on their instrument that will diminish uh, the life of their career and so on. So it is, it, you know, I think we're, again, in the same push-pull that we ever were, you know, whether it was in Mozart's time or Bizet's time or now. 
Oh. I was talking about that yesterday only because Adele had to concert, you know, cancel all her upcoming concerts with 2011. And I was thinking, I have no idea, but she's so young, she's 23, and she goes from sort of like, suddenly she has to give concerts all over the world, and every concert has to be the length of an album. And, you know, she's young. Does she have any kind of technique to sustain that mm -hmm. kind of singing every day of her life? You know, what would she sound? What would she do if she had? If she had, right, right exactly, because she's fantastic. Right. But yeah. Yeah. you know, it's um, yeah. I mean, I think it's not a question we're going to answer in this hour. <laughs> but um, I would love to uh, actually talk a bit about subject matter. Um, this is a, a question. Uh, you know, how how do you uh, decide that that something wants to sing as an opera? Um, and how much do you think of your audiences? How much do you think of the commissioners? Or how much do you think of trying to get a commission by choosing certain subject matter? What things figure into your choice of subject matter for authors? I'll, I'll just say for me, heat. That, <laughs> it, that if, if I don't feel any heat about it, if I can't feel like I'm going to cook with that idea, mm -hmm. that's everything. Even if you're asked to do like I was asked to do Grapes of Wrath, I wouldn't have oh, thought of it. Really? But then I read the book and I was like, you know, there's enormous heat in that story and that's everything to me. If you can connect, you can make it into an opera. Mm -hmm. Garden of the Fins and Continues was, was my idea. I brought it to Michael because I've been obsessed with that story since that movie came out. And it's just, it's all about heat to me. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, Stuart and I had a, a wonderful idea for an opera following the authors that we were going to do uh, an opera based on a novel by Sarah Schulman. Mm. That didn't go ahead, but somebody else proposed Pardon Milk. And I think we responded, oh my god, mm -hmm. that really had. It the was they should have had a V8 kind of moment. Felt, <laughs> yeah. felt like an opera. Yeah. Wow. That's interesting. Felt like an opera. And that's the way all operas should originate. But I think, Corey, the other thing is that, you know, it's different for any, any person, right. and it's intensely personal mm -hmm. what you respond to, what you want to spend, mm -hmm. however much time you're going to spend sure. writing it. It's a long time, usually. Um, I think that the audience is, I mean, for me, the audience is my collaborators, mm -hmm. and it's what we want to do and what we want to make and what mm -hmm. kind of gets our juices flowing. So I would, I would second the idea of heat mm -hmm. and just connection and excitement, because it's also an intense opportunity to learn something. Mm -hmm. You know, you can go in and kind of have your, uh, you can live your life as an adult education course <laughs> by choosing the things that you're interested in mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. finding mm -hmm. those things. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's what we, we, we I was sort of loosely, obliquely interested in American polygamy, you know, uh -huh. in, in, in the same way that everyone sort of casually is. You, know, you pick up a paper, you're like, oh, funny dress. Right. You know, yeah. <laughs> 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 right. Yeah, and then you're next. Sure. But, but then we sort of, we sort of <laughs> met a couple times and start, you know, what's, what's cool about something like, the, the topic. Yeah, right. I mean, we, I knew it's a site. It's a site-specific thing, but mm -hmm. I mean, there, it's also it's a topic about which there's a large but actually finite amount written. Mm -hmm. Like you can kind of see the bottom of the hole mm -hmm. in a sense, which uh -huh. is kind of great. Like it's you know, there's probably a couple hundred books, a couple thousand articles. Like yeah. it's not a. Really. It's not like more. wow. You know, it's not, it's only been around for for it's it's only been been written about kind of really actively for mm -hmm. a couple hundred years. So mm -hmm. it's not like a you know it's it's not like a big Theoretical it's, it's, civil war. Century, it's not like yeah. the Civil War, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also, it's kind of hot because of the cable series, you know, the... Um, right. <laughs> right. Right. So, but that was, um, you know, that you came up with that idea, the two of you uh, on your own. Well, it, but it, it felt like adult education really was... <laughs> he threw some books at me. And, and then I, he threw I some books at me. I spent a summer in Cedar City, Utah, so I was ah. obsessed with Southwest Utah. I was obsessed with the landscape. I was obsessed with all the women in the quasi-Victorian fairy dresses, uh, and it was a great excuse to just, once I, you know, because it, so it was like a great idea, that, mm -hmm. that Nico serves, like, you know, it made sense to me, but it wasn't until, so you can go back to the very beginnings, read about the wives of, of you know, of, of the Joseph diaries of Smith Joseph Smith's wives, mm -hmm. and of Brigham Young, um, uh -huh. between them were over 70, uh, and there was, there's just all of this, it's like a direct emotional through line to the, like, to the women who, 
you can now buy their memoirs at Walmart. Right. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Now, you know the ones who are appearing on on, on, on CNN, and, 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 right? Yeah. And it's all it has to it has to all do with, with just you know they're in the most isolated pocket mm -hmm. of the country, and all of the which is strangely ninety country, minutes from Vegas, which is ninety minutes from Vegas. <laughs> well, I, yeah, that is weird. Like literally, <laughs> but it's like the town is like Buttress stuff against the you know north rim of the Grand Canyon, and their emotional like lives are so are suppressed for so long that reading the sort of the first the diary entries and the memoirs, it's. Uh, it just became great fodder in terms of them thinking of them singing because right. their inner body it was all it was all inner. And then when they actually make a move and they step foot outside, it becomes like the biggest action. And right. It's the most well, it shocking. Felt, it thing felt like ever. in reading the things that, that a libretto would write itself quickly without mm -hmm. and it would that it wouldn't require I mean this isn't a more pre like a more nerdy kind of practical thing, but <laughs> that it wouldn't require too much like Forcing mm -hmm. to yeah. get to make yeah. to make a libretto out of a tie, and that's the yeah. scary thing is that the hard part was flipping these also like manually with people, children, under this. Right. literally like the, the solving that problem was like if we start to get the kids all the taken children, away. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah right. we sort of started mm -hmm. with with a, if it's yeah. making it about women coping with mm -hmm. the aftermath right. of a government raid in which all of their children have been taken away. From uh. them. Otherwise, it wouldn't be chamber opera. It would be, right. Right. It would be some brand that with the supernumerary. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, Nico, of course, uh, your, your, uh, the two boys, the opera for ENO and Met, that is, is a completely different kind of a... Right. Uh, we were talking a little bit beforehand about the difference between writing the chambered opera and a grand opera. So how did you come up with that particular that story? That was actually, that, that was a really kind of heated, heated moment, <laughs> right? Basically, I, I've been, you know, this, is, this is around 2001, 2002, and I, I was reading BBC online, and it was like a curious case in the north of England in which a young boy was stabbed, and then it, and and it was later revealed that he had um, sort of engineered his own stabbing by pretending to be a series of different women online to seduce an older boy. And I was like, well, that's an opera. Yeah, literally. Really? Not even not even like I would write oh. one about that. That's like mm -hmm. he literally wrote an opera and and made this th and you know, created this this mm -hmm. strange situation, and it felt so. It felt so obvious, and again, it was one of those things where it's like a libretto for that could happen without, without a great amount of, of like manipulation. Mm -hmm. That you can, but you know, it, it's. Well, I'm sure I mean, it was good. Yeah. I'm, sure, I'm sure Craig would disagree, but it, but it's, but essentially, you know, you, you have all these fake characters all coming from the mind of a of a very like charged young child, mm -hmm. um, and then you and then what you do is you set the whole thing in, in the context of the investigation around it, mm -hmm. so an older woman saying. What, how can how can this stabbing actually be this like virtual thing happening? Mm. How, how is it all existing in a masked ball? Space, yes. Which is essentially what we did. So it was, again, it was like it, it was like a thirty second kind of mm -hmm. whoa, and yeah. then it's obvious what to do. Yeah. Well, so that's it's, um, interesting in developing these these original stories, which are based on quite um, contemporary issues, issues that are. Uh, of now and, and very much, uh, I think, in the forefront of contemporary people's minds. What about uh, the issue of adapting material from, you know, say, an existing uh, play or novel, as with Bone Sutter's Daughter or um, the uh, Grapes of Wrath? Uh, how do you uh, choose something to adapt, and, and how do you go about that, particularly adapting something from? A very different form, a novel to um, a, uh, a stage work, a well, stage work music. You know, Bowen said I was originally still asking to work with in the tenant, and uh -huh. I was uh, in awe of that. Uh -huh. uh, and ultimately, I dropped out and became a tenant with her own bread. Oh. It was wildly different from her really? book and wonderful. Yeah. And, uh, and it took liberties in a way that I never would have been free. But with Grapes of Wrath, when Steinbeck was way out of the way. Yes, right. And I Very basically different. read that book and assimilated it, but I didn't feel any of the dialogue in the whole thing mm -hmm. would work as some. Uh, any of it? None of it. Wow. Basically, if you go through my libretto and, and Steinbeck, you'll find one phrase mm -hmm. or one text maybe in each of the things, and the rest of it is approximates the feeling of what's going on but I just sort of mm -hmm. wrote in that vein and didn't use the exact text because it was yep, very short, abrupt things that I felt wouldn't serve Ricky's music or the kind of nature that we wanted this to be. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I also just had to bring my own stuff to it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, why do it? 
uh, in this day and age as a historical piece. So, you know, I change stuff. Um, and, you know, of course, I love uh, migrant workers from Mexico. And, uh, so that it could work, but it has to speak to the audience. I mean, Republican men came up to me with tears in their eyes <laughs> and said, oh, now I understand this border. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, now, boy, mm -hmm. that's, that's potent. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's why I did. Man, that really uh, reinforces our, our reasons for wanting to be in this in this business. Well, I mean, truthfully, if you have that that tendency in you, uh, mm -hmm. to want to proselytize a bit, opera is a great place to find Oh, Because oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's where they put, put all their money. Wow. Well, I was wondering whether you checked your voter registration yeah, cards. You can find them very easily. Just scratch the surface. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, um... You know what, Corey? Yeah. I, can I say one thing about that, that question? Because it's really interesting in terms of adapting something like Gordon the Finzi Continues, which is what brought me to that property was the movie. Uh -huh. But then we didn't adapt the movie, we adapted the book. Mm -hmm. And essentially, what I forgot when I fell in love with that is it's about quiet people. Uh -huh. And um, so what I think Michael did really brilliantly, but I think the challenge in adapting a property like that is the noisiest medium mm -hmm. adapting a very quiet mm -hmm. story and how to make it noisy and how to articulate those people that are refined and somewhat, um, in or, not inarticulate, but repressed. It was, a yeah, really interesting challenge. This is interesting. Some of these, um, you know, uh, my, the class that I teach for ALT on opera dramaturgy, uh, we were just, this past week, we did a close reading of the opera Carmen and, and the source material, the novella by Prosper Merrime, and we, we talked about some of these same kinds of techniques and issues that you're describing in adapting um, these properties. It's really and how do you, yeah, just how do you articulate characters? Yeah. Really, you know, and just taking kernels from the source material sometimes, sometimes, and, and kind of developing. And just to say, and it's a it's a great thing about collaboration. It was even like there's one moment in that opera where I just said to Michael, "There's a in the in the movie. There's this beautiful scene when Giorgio is rejected by Nicole, and that he just screams at his father, just leave me to die.' And his father just says, "Let yourself die now." It's good when you're young, because when you get old. And I just said to Michael, that's my favorite moment in mm. the book, in the movie, and Michael wrote this beautiful aria, Let Yourself Die, My Boy. And it was just a moment where I was so grateful to be an opera composer. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That I got to sort of swim in what really moved me about that father-son moment. And it, now it's a huge moment for me in that, you know, well, I don't know how you guys work, but we're very much kick it back and forth. And yeah, I think that's a good way of working. Yeah. yeah, that's what I, I want to talk about next really was the collaboration. And of course, um, you know, Michael, it's interesting that you've worked with these with two of these composers. And Nico, you have uh, actually been working with two different librettists. So um, I'd love to talk about, you know, how do you find ideal collaborators? What, what can, you know, what makes an ideal collaboration and how does how do collaborations differ? How does how does your work differ? Does does a different collaborator uh, bring different kinds of uh, writing or you know, different kinds of music mm -hmm. out of you? Mm -hmm. I would say different collaborators bring different ideas. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And the and I don't mean ideas in terms of language. I mean ideas in terms of shape, structure. I mean the myth about librettists, I think, mm -hmm. is that it's about the words. Uh -huh. I mean it's good to have somebody who has words that can sing. That's sort of the basic thing. But really what a good librettist does is create an armature for the music mm -hmm. and create great, space wow. for it to, mm -hmm. to, to, to live and breathe and sing. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, like I think in, in particular in Michael's work, it's the ideas behind the words that fuel mm -hmm. the music. And so I would say different, different writers bring different ideas in that way. And different collaborations generate different kinds of ideas so that you can look at something quite differently given the chemistry of the people involved. Mm -hmm. The best advice to, of opera writing for the rarest ever given to me was given to me by, of all people, Julie Stein. Oh, really? Who said, uh, kid, I was writing my own music at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, uh, you write the music first? I said, well, yeah. He said, good. I always make the composers write to my music. 
because the music has to be saying what the words are already saying. Mm. Um, and that's proven to me time and time again when I work with great composers like uh, Ricky and Stewart. I mean, I wrote uh, an end of Act One for Hardy Milk, which was probably three pages long. Stewart cut that libretto down to three lines wow. and made the music explode with it. Uh -huh. Ricky did the same sort of thing. And everything I ever wanted to say mm -hmm. was in the music. Yeah. And, but it was about creating that moment, and you took what you needed from that. Stephen, we were talking a little bit uh, apropos of this before we started um, about you, know, this, you being a playwright uh, by trade and coming into author for the first time, as you said, you know, an author fan, not necessarily an author file, but um, your first experience of, of, of as a playwright writing an author with that, and the difference. Um, can you address that a little bit? I mean, because I was writing a play at the same time, I think what was fun for me was just realizing that um, switching sort of uh, just the way my brain functions so that when I'm creating, when I was creating words for Nico, I was doing it with, with the knowledge that if I give him the right words, the music should be doing all of the heavy lifting in terms of the drama, which doesn't mean that I, you know, it still has to be present in the structure and in the words, but you know our back and forth was so great because it, it took me not so long to realize just um, it almost became like like doing like a crossword puzzle like how few words can say so much with you know one or two strains of music. Mm -hmm. We had we had similar moments too where it was like you'd write a thing which th which then basically yeah. you, you we just we would figure We'd out go like that. Yeah, we would like cut half of it. Cut off. half of it and figure, and, and it's or there would be the thing where I would say something and you'd be like, make this like three beats longer. Like you'd, there'd be the flip side where like you'd, you'd find an interesting idea. And, you know. um, but yeah, I mean, I sort of went into it sort of liking that puzzle-like challenge of, of mm -hmm. you know, how can I give him what I thought were was just enough but not too much. And of course, then it's an endless series of like uh, less more. Not enough. Wrong <laughs> idea. Yeah. I mean, one of the one of the hardest things for me because I'm I, I feel like I'm I'm kind of a stupid opera goer. Like I I'm, I want to know what's going on at all times, and I feel like I feel like in a lot of opera I don't really. Mm. Like I went to see the summer I I had this opera that was in in rep with with um, Bucca Negra. I literally could not tell you to put a gun to my head what happens in the opera. Well, that's not an easy one. And it's like, yeah, it was so complicated. And I was like, who's that? that? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, who's this girl? But Nico, I was going to, I think it's surprising that you say that because I, I had did not, I had not met you. This today is the first time we're meeting. But I was really impressed with your, um, when I went to see Peter Grimes, who had a, an essay in the book Little Met thing. that I thought was so smart and articulate. So I think he was a smart opera. No, no, but he's <laughs> <laughs> Peter Grimes. You know exactly what's going on because it's so genius. It's like you yeah, know, it's, and I, I, it's sort of it's like also in England. <laughs> well, one, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm decent enough Italian that I can understand physically the words that are you right. Know, plus, it was spoken Negra in English, oh, really? which is double crazy. Oh yeah, no, girl, yeah. it was anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> but so I guess what I'm saying is that on on every the, the thing the thing with Libretti is that there's either there's music that's going and there's music that's we're stopping to say something. Right? Yes. Uh -huh. Right. But yes. that's the basic exactly. breakdown is that yeah. there's, there's like, there's motion. And sometimes and both. And sometimes both. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and really, if you're stopping to say something, then we, you can we can afford the kind of poet poetry and you can, you can afford a kind of gem of a line kind of thing. But if you're going, it kind of has to be, it kind of has to be this. this I think lines a little bit either conversation. I mean, Nico is so good at setting conversational dialogue. Mm -hmm. Um, Which is that just has to you. He's so we, one of our things we never had to have back and forth. He would set something, and it would always be you would take you would take something that kind of worked, and, and oftentimes it, it, it felt only right with the music in terms of tempo, right. like you, you know the cadence of speech, and so it would be these mundane lines, and it's this simple back and forth, but you you just you connected like the, the length of the notes to cadence of speech, you know. Well, you just have to you have to make it as kind of natural as you can let's you know let's move through and it just we need to have forward. a line. It literally has the, the effect of two people having kind of just a like so, yeah like like this. That's the business. That's the process. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. how that's yeah. how opera started way yeah. back in Florence in fifteen ninety eight. You know, they just it's they the said they wanted it. a heightened conversation. Yeah. Know, yeah. And but then it's interesting I, and I wonder what your experience is, is of this if, if you know when you when you really kind of oh 
open up when you, when you expand. Does that feel does that feel like a and in an opera there will be a couple of those per act, right? Like a, a kind of and maybe not even a couple. Yeah. Maybe like two. I <laughs> think that I think that's one of the joys of doing an opera where the music you just have to allow it to take off. And sometimes uh, you have to fill in the Venus Paradise. Uh, <laughs> you have to fill in so that, that the music honest. can can do what it and still advance the story. And you know, some of the young people that I was teaching at the Yale Drama School uh, were afraid to go there, afraid to get Florid or, or whatever they thought it was. Mm -hmm. I said, no, 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 listen to the great operas. If Wagner can go on for a fucking hour <laughs> with one character, <laughs> wow. oh my God. you can go on yeah. for five minutes. <laughs> 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 one yeah. of right. right. oh right. oh yeah. yeah. so then, But then the question, I mean, the, que the question of length is an interesting one too, because if you look at a libretto, you know, it's whatever, 15 pages long, for what can amount to be, I mean, the, the relationship of, of the, you know, how long it takes you to read versus how long it takes you to set, and that was something that was so fun with, with Dark Sisters, is that there's a lot of stuff that goes really quickly, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I was like, okay, that's like two minutes, and then, then you have five lines that were so kind of delicious, I was like, that's like an hour, like, yeah, you know, yeah. it really takes a, yeah. And you know, and sometimes the more poetic language requires just liter literally a slower, yeah. a slower tempo, but not so slow that you can't appreciate the line as like a, a thing that the brain remembers the beginning of, but the time you get to the end, mm -hmm. which is a, a, a difficult challenge. So it's really about tempering how often how often you're in that slow mo, yeah, you're pacing. But this is this. I mean, all these things that we're talking about now in terms of tempo and. I mean, it sounds to me, and it, it always feels to me like the role of the composer in setting the libretto the is like a film director. Right. It's yeah. about creating yeah. in image, time, space, yes. and or like a stage director too. So that um, what the composer actually does is he in, he or she interprets or gives environment or creates the the feeling, the sense of space, the yeah. sense of time that you that embody. And I think that's the thing that you know, if you're going to ever discuss what can be different between certain forms. Mm -hmm. That's something that opera actually does and is required to do, is that the music's got to take has to be time. time. It has to be in charge of time. If yes. I go to see a new piece, mm -hmm. and the first thing I want to know is, can that composer hold the stage time? Right. Well, yeah. So totally yeah. true. And it's yeah. also like, and for me as an opera goer, length is like a serious, like physical <laughs> oh, yeah. big thing. You mm -hmm. know? And, well, because when I was, I, I didn't use the opera a lot, I grew up in Vermont and in Providence or whatever, and, and it's like, the, you know, you, you listen at your house. And you're wandering around, and you're you know opening the score, but you you, know, you can pee when you want to. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a feel. I mean, I, this sounds crazy, but it's like some operas. You're like, are you shitting me? That you want me to stay here for three hours without leaving? <laughs> like, I mean, it's a real, and, and length can be really oppressive in some operas, and it can be a function. Well, and sometimes the oppression is interesting to create effect too. Yeah, yeah. exactly. There, there's, and, there's this the is, and this is something that that with with, Vog with Wagner, you get yeah. you really get a sense of your your it's your long situation. haul flight. I mean, to and they don't yeah. Yeah. Like in Bayreuth, they lock you in. Oh, yeah. yeah. Literally. It's <laughs> like, it's <good. laughs> yeah. Or if you think about, or if you think about something like, you know, um, a good example is, well, it, even even the, que the question of, you know, having a really short ending of, of, of a piece. Like, if you think about um, people who do Midsummer, where it's the first two acts are, are without intermission, mm -hmm. and then the third act is just this kind of like whoosh through the through the mechanicals. That can be really fun, yeah. but you really are you really, you really are in charge of, of occupying people's time, mm -hmm. and I, I feel like I you know I, I can't possibly ask anyone for any more than than two hours. <laughs> but yeah. you're oh, of but a new you generation. Maybe, maybe I can, but I feel like, yes. I, I feel like I'm not. I think it's generational. Yeah, I mean, well, because sure. especially I mean, if you've grown up on technology, and I mean nobody. It's like we're living in an ADHD world <laughs> now, <laughs> and I feel like. In a, in a way, it's smart and practical to, to yeah. deal with time. But that real way. talk, real talk, like like Anna, Anna Bolena, which I just saw. Yeah, that is. In, I, I feel like maybe I'm gonna like I'm gonna be pelted by fruit or something. But <laughs> it's, it's it's entirely long. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's long. I mean, it's not, and it's not long. I think to any great. Great sort of benefit to anyone involved. <laughs> but it's, 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 it was a I'm different like, world. It was yeah, a different time. People had time to sit there but for four but hours but and just no, hear exactly. Pisces. But during the overture, I was like, yeah, yeah. But there is a <laughs> 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 That's great. 
go. I, was, I want to see. I want to see the behavior. Go crazy. Yeah, I, it's, 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 it's what we paid for. It's for the it's different. It, it's yeah. A, you know, uh, Ricky is exactly right about that. It's it's created in, in a time period, and I think that you know, like like any art form, you know, if you're going to go in, you're going to see the Shakespeare player, you know, a, a Moliere play or something like that. You know, you got to put on your, you know, your 18th or 19th century. You know, hat and, and kind Surrender of to the time insane. element yeah. because it's like you're not going to be home at, in, in time for Project Moon. Yeah. 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 You've got to you yeah. tape it. You can, not not to, you can surrender to the time element, but you don't have to surrender to the time. I mean, the time, right. because right. if the piece is relevant, and it yes. should be if we're watching yes. it, yes. I don't believe that we have to deal with the museum culture. I really don't. Mm -hmm. But if the piece is relevant, it should speak to us now, mm -hmm. in, 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 on its own terms or on our terms or both, but you don't have to surrender to the fact that something is boring. Yeah. Yeah. Or it's, it's, you know, that it's just making you think about the time. And then, I mean, yeah. and stage time is different mm -hmm. than real time. Sometimes if you take one idea and spin it out over the longest amount of yeah. time, it feels like a couple of minutes. Right. Right. And if you do a thousand ideas in that same period of time, it feels like hours. Right. Right. So, so, yeah. But you know what, can I say one major thing about that? Only because when we mentioned the Peter Grimes thing, and this is like, okay, this is controversial. Mm -hmm. But, for example, one of the things that Britain does brilliantly in that piece is he gives you a sense of the sea. And the sea interludes are not boring, they're breathtaking. Right. However, in that production at the Met where you wrote this brilliant program notes, oh. well, and it, it was a production that decided to ignore right. that there was an ocean right. involved. Right. Yeah. And so every single sea interlude was just nothing. And then you feel like if anyone questions Britain's pacing because of this stupid production that doesn't deal with the major thing that surrounds the story. And this is, I mean, this is the interesting thing, I, and this is something that we, that we did, we were writing, I mean, the, you know, Dark Sisters was just an hour and 40 minutes of music, but it, I always try to imagine what, what's the worst production? What could the worst production of this <laughs> oh, yeah. do? Because the question, you know, because yeah. the thing is, in a lot of cases, if you write a sort of production proof piece, mm -hmm. you know, oh, yeah. There are some. There are some. I mean, I feel, like, I feel like Tosca, I feel like it's hard to be bored of Tosca. That's you know, true. Yeah. And I've seen a lot yeah. of of Tosca yeah. and Tosca <laughs> <laughs> have never been seen. Yeah, there are a few authors. You know, there's a couple, and, I, and for, for me, mid, uh, in the midsummer you can get a little more, but, but uh, um, Turn of the Screws. Yeah, it's pretty it's difficult to get more. Now, Grimes is interesting, because I, I, I've always felt like that that music I, I almost don't want to sing anymore. I don't want to just listen. Mm. So it's, it's just a funny, and I think it's just something to keep in mind when you're writing, is even if you're collaborating with a director, Especially for collaborating with the director, you also have to imagine the like outrageous Dutch version in a century, <laughs> where the entire thing is like you know, in dumpsters and whatever. Like you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's good to have everyone is just bad. Yeah, exactly. But also, yeah. you, this, I mean, this this would be the game, right? Is to sure. is to write an opera in which. In, in which everyone is like, you know, performing sex acts in an industrial wasteland and then actually have it set in like, in, you know, Mantua or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nico, I saw um, on, on YouTube a scene from, um, is it Two Boys? That's the name of it, right? Could have been, yeah. To, well, just the one with, um, where everyone has a computer in front of them. And I thought it was a great image. Yeah, just to sort of me people mesmerize. Yes, by, it's yeah. the chorus, right? Yeah, it's one of them. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was. That was the, the chorus of uh, perverts and children. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, in the remaining time that we have, I'd love to um, turn it over for questions from uh, our the, the viewers. Our um, anybody would like to pose a question to these gents? <coughs> okay. Yeah. I'd, love, I'd love to hear more about what you thought of Ricky about the quietness um, and how you dealt with how much the articulating of the quiet characters. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, well, we wrote that opera libretto twice. Uh, in the first draft, uh, which was, I think, the more daring draft, it was all happening outside the wall. People choosing to not notice what was happening, and then suddenly it was upon them. Um, but we did a workshop, and let me say, opera companies are not very good at doing workshops. Um, They're terrible. They, they, well, that's another, that's another story. You have, to, you, have to, small you have to think about it. You have to do it in small, small bits and pieces. It's 
very difficult to do and learn an entire thing. Or you have to not do it, which or is not what I've chosen it. to right. do. Oh, right. Really? This yeah. Is yeah. <laughs> right. But uh, I did see from that that um, because of the heat of the subject, even though the story dealt with it in an understandable way, it wasn't helping the music, it wasn't helping the opera, the opera. So I wrote in more confrontation in the next draft, and it's probably a better opera but a less literary which is Interesting. Which is good. Some of the greatest opera in, in history are, are not necessarily the greatest literature. No, they're not great literature, mm -hmm. no. But they, uh, I definitely don't agree with that, though. I, I don't agree that it's less literary. I just think it was... It's simplified in the characters of Greer. Is, is how it was. Is, it was easier well, to find motivation. I also, I also was Wait. expecting <laughs> way too much of people to understand who Mussolini was, what the Axis was, all kinds of history that they have forgotten, that they that they never knew. Mm -hmm. And you just can't take that much for granted, that much history, because I know so much implication, so much about Jewish tradition that they didn't understand either. So I had to be a little. And of course, we made the gay brother gay. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, Michael, I'm interested uh, with the, with the Grapes of Wrath adaptation. Um, how involved was the Steinbeck estate with this? Were they like, oh, were, they were they fierce? Yes. <laughs> were they but, tough to deal with? Yes, but they liked it. And I was lucky with the Bassani estate. Uh, it continues. They also liked. It. But these are the right originals. Mm. It um, took two years to get the rights for this done because they were really. Right. Really? And then they were also, I mean, part of the, I lucked out actually, because it could have been a lot worse. The Steinbeck estate, if you recall, was suing it itself. Um, the Grapes of Wrath was, was, the rights of the Grapes of, of Wrath were left to Steinbeck's widow, Elaine Steinbeck. But his children from his first wife, were engaged in suing her after she died, her estate, to get the rights back. And they sort of ignored what was going on with Grapes of Wrath opera. They because the they deadline. had some veto power over it. And I did major rearrangements to make this work as an opera. Um, and they missed their deadline. And they didn't read it. And yay! Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was. Uh, I'll try this at home. <laughs> you had a question. Yeah, it's sort of more general question for everybody, but I guess especially for for Pico and Stephen, just generationally, because so much of what I know about dramatic rhythm I've learned from like serial television, mm. <laughs> and so whenever I go into the opera house, everything just seems like really, really slow. You know, what I would say is that if you if you imagine if you can if you can imagine that Law and Order is like something that we all, we all know what an episode of Law and Order is mm -hmm. and how it works and when things are going to happen and right like it's a kind of formulaic thing. I feel like a lot of Italian opera is like that, right? Yes. In terms of when you're going to get the you know it's it just happens to take let's say twice as long. Mm -hmm. But I I think I think that <coughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of Italian opera that's proportionally similarly successful mm -hmm. to an episode of Law and Order or to an episode of like SVU. Right. Um, and so it's, it's never been, what's SVU? Special <laughs> Victims Against the oh, Sex okay. Thank you. <laughs> have you not seen it? No. Oh, you just have sent so many DVDs. Oh it's my god. Crazy. I'm so excited. It, but it's, it's hard. Like I, 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 I grew up sort of, for me like the, the, the something like Einstein on the Beach is like enormously engaging to me in, in some weird way. Crazily, um, I can I can sort of, for, for instance, I, ha I have a lot of difficulty entering into um, sort of late therapy sometimes, mm. and a lot of difficulty entering into um, uncut Baroque opera. <laughs> I, I find to be difficult. It's a whole different, it's a whole different conversation. Yeah. It, I, I, think, I think the best thing to do is to, is to try to imagine it in terms of the, the, the generous way to listen is to try to imagine it in terms of something that, that probably was in some way formulaic at the time, right? And, I mean, and the exception to that is sort of Wagner, where it's, you know, you just have to kind of, you either have to have to lie down in it or not. Um, well, that's formulaic in a whole different it's way. It's formulaic in his own crazy way. Yeah. And, and the other thing with, with op operatic 
timing is, I, and I think, I assume that a lot, you know, if you go to Wagner, the production is also meant to help you pass that time, right? Like a, like a movie <laughs> and a play. Um, and, and you just have to find a Wagner director that you like, really. And, and you know, for me, it's Wilson. Outrageous, in which not shit happens, yeah. where it's like a bar of light, like slowly turns, and it, I'm like the happiest puppy. Uh -huh. Actually, the two things are linked. I think that the, the sense of time in Wagner is basically spitting out one idea over long right. passages mm -hmm. of time, and that's the same thing in Einstein. And in Einstein, it actually happens both visually and, and yeah. Musically. Yeah. 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 So the synergy between those two and things physically. takes you somewhere yeah. else. No, yeah. it's yeah, no, exactly. And yeah. it's a thing where you're like, when, even when you know what's going to happen, right? It's like it's like a ship hoving into view. Even when you know the bar of light's going to go vertical, yeah. you're, yeah. Like, you're like, it's like it's 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 yeah. yeah. But you know what? Else, one thing about that too, though, I think that opera is the one form that it really does demand. If you really know the piece you're going to see, it's just gonna, not going to feel as long, I think. Mm -hmm. I think people go to Lohengrin or Parsifal, and they've never heard it. And then they're like, it's long. And it, it is <laughs> long. It's unbearable. But it also like really helps to know it. It, hel it helps to know it, and it also helps to... Yeah, it, like, if, there, if you're going to learn a thing, you can either learn the piece, you can learn the piece as well as you can, but you have to see, like, if you just see, like, Forza del Destino, God forbid, <laughs> you can... You can help yourself. You can help yourself, kind of bear the time, by by just figure, figuring out structurally what's going on, figuring out where the things are that that are in each of the nineteen acts, like where the kind of <laughs> you know the, what what you should look out for in a weird way. It's sort of like it's sort of like when someone gives you directions to get to their country house or whatever, and they're like, "There's a cover bridge on the left." There's you know, it's just when you're reading it, it seems less daunting than you know, point the car north for seven hours and drive to Maine. Right. You have little <laughs> signposts yeah. to watch exactly. out for. Don Carlos, by the way, is great long verity. It oh, is great long verity. Oh, That's yeah. really a great long yeah. verity. And you need a fabulous like heretic kind of. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. But it's rich and it's full of opportunity. We have one more question before we. Yes. Um, for all of you, do you feel right now that there is any kind of balance between? Conventional expectation that an opera needs to be structured like what we used to call a well made play versus something that maybe just is immediately you know, gripping from an audience but may not follow someone's idea of what you know, a well constructed dramatic tune should be. Um, can I do this in a sort of slightly tangential way? Because I think a well made play is actually. Um, antithetical to making a good opera in a way. You don't want to tie everything up in neat little packages because then it then it is really just boring. You're waiting for each thing to be tied. But I would say that in terms of music, the thing that I've learned over time for my own self is that the more I allow things to have resonance, and I mean musical motifs, the way they have resonance with each other, and sometimes less ideas and more resonance actually provides not not the kind of structure and sense of feeling of well made, but it provides a kind of emotional release because we, we get connected to those ideas and then as those ideas evolve, musically and dramatically and thematically, those ideas give us that sense of emotional catharsis. So I would say it's not the well made part, it's the part that is, um, I'll give you an example too, at the end of Bonesetter's Daughter, in the, in the book The Mother Doesn't Die, well the first thing I said to Amy is, you know, and it was written right after her mother died, so she, I think she couldn't write it if the mother died. I said, you know, th this is an opera the mother has to die. And, and so the idea was, there was some confusion, and, and the opera company wanted us to have a moment of, you know, inspiration for the daughter writer figure, the Amy Tan figure, you know, who would then go and write a book. Well, nobody cares about that. What was important was the emotional release, and it was not well made because we have a, we have in the beginning of the opera, um, you know, the, the main character's husband and her stepchildren and the in-laws. We never see them again after the first act because nobody gives a shit about them. They are there as as a way to get to something else, is to show the cultural conflict and to create a breach in which you can then go into the past. And so. The idea of making that well made originally we wanted to. Originally we had a funeral at the end and they were going to all come back and all, all this crap that was not interesting. Uh, we ended it with the mother being taken by the, the ghost of the grandmother away and leaving the daughter there. It was really about the three women. So the thing was, well made, who cares? It wasn't well made, in fact, and it was something else, but it was emotionally uh, true to the ideas and the sense of the piece. And, and one of the things that made me want to make an opera out of it was that. 
there was this sense in the book that there was a selectively permeable membrane between the past and the present. And so this idea of collapsing time is, is inherently musical. And it spoke to me as something that could, that actually music could say something different about in a different way and convey some of the same ideas. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's, it's an angle. So Conrad and I are working on uh, an opera, which I hope isn't a well-made play. You know, the well-made play sounds to me is a, is a term that I don't refer to Sir Terence Radigan or something. Um, uh, they're very good. They're wonderful. Um, but I don't think that's what audiences, audience have been changed by contemporary literature, by film. We want to see plays like your play. Um, it sound, promise us <laughs> something <laughs> thrilling that we haven't seen before. Right yeah. And yeah. I'm running out to see that play. Me too. Um, and what we want to see is good. We don't want to see well, the well-made. Do you think it, it, makes, it turns it into a well-made? I mean, because I don't right, know what that means. I think anything well, that works is well-made. Right, we want to see, we want to see but good, we want to see exciting, we want to see yeah. unexpected. I think, you know, like, so yeah. But, but we, we, I don't but, know if that's what we don't want. Sort of it's, it's, me it's, and I'm, you know, it's a well, like, no, but, I, but like I was going to say, like, like Street Corner and Desire. I mean, this is not like to criticize that opera, but in some ways, I think it's possible that the librettist and composer were somewhat hamstrung by how well it works as a play. Yeah. Right. It doesn't right. need exactly. anybody to come and make it a thing. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you, I mean, a good, a good example is to reverse engineer, like write the play Peter Grimes. Like, would you ever go to that? No. <laughs> exactly. It's like he walks into the bar and is drunk and a little depressed. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like the O'Neill. Like. No, well, exactly. <laughs> it's like, I probably have seen that. But it, there, there's a, there's you know a sense what? too that super titles have changed everything. Yeah. Oh my whether God. You like, <laughs> whether you like them or not. Or whether you need them or not for an English opera, uh -huh. the audience has is brought in a whole bunch of people that are watching opera, mm -hmm. and they're there. We have to be grateful that they came to see live music and uh, theater. Except they hear less when they're reading. Well, okay, but I think that this is an evolving thing, and what it does mean is that they're not going to tolerate anything that doesn't make sense or that's shoddy uh, or self-indulgent. And they wouldn't tolerate it from a film or play. They're not going to tolerate it from your opera. So I, I think what we have, a lot of young people are writing, thinking they can get away with shtick by calling it avant-garde. Now, avant-garde is fantastic. I love Von movies. I loved all those avant-garde. But the, they're really very pure and ascetic, those people. And it's not just sort of an amalgam of a lot of stuff that you weren't able to fit into a conventional narrative, so you called it a bond. That's what we don't want. That's not good anything. Well, we could go on with these fascinating gentlemen, obviously, into the wee hours, but there are bagels and Danish to eat. <laughs> so thank you so much, Stephen Perra, Michael Muley, Ruby Ian Gordon, um, Stuart Wallace, and Michael Corey. Thank you so much.